Monsieur Ryan, j'ai trois sujets à vous exposer. La première, ça concerne la plateforme YouTube qui efface les contenus qui contredisent le consensus des experts d'autorité sanitaire locale ou de l'Organisation mondiale de la santé au sujet du vaccin contre le Covid. Les vidéos du docteur Robert Malone sont toutes censurées. La dernière en date concerne une vidéo sur les myocardites liées au vaccin Covid. Pourtant, l'OMS a déclaré en 2021 un lien de causalité probable entre la myocardite et les vaccins à ARN messagers. Les cas rapportés sont généralement survenus dans les jours qui ont suivi la vaccination, plus fréquemment chez les jeunes hommes et plus souvent après la deuxième dose des vaccins ARN messagers contre le Covid-19. Est-ce que l'entreprise YouTube a-t-elle contacté l'OMS pour décider quels contenus doivent être censurés en ce qui concerne les myocardites Quel est le processus Comment YouTube communique à vous À quelle fréquence Qui choisit les experts proposés à YouTube Avez-vous défini une limite temporelle ou une censure éternelle est-elle prévue Deuxièmement. L'OMS est chargée d'indiquer la phase de la période pandémique. Après la phase 6, il y a une, péri il y a une période post-pic et une période post-pandémique. Joe Biden a déclaré en septembre que la pandémie était terminée. Pourquoi l'OMS n'a-t-elle pas déjà indiqué que nous ne sommes plus en phase 6 Quel est le seuil critère utilisé et quelles seraient les conséquences juridiques d'un changement de phase en période post-pic ou période post-pandémique Par exemple, en termes de responsabilité des entreprises pharmaceutiques ou des effets secondaires. Dernièrement, alors que l'Agence européenne du médicament et la Haute Autorité de Santé ont donné le feu vert à l'utilisation des nouveaux vaccins bivalents contre le Covid-19, notamment dans le cadre de la campagne vaccinale ayant débuté le 3 octobre dernier, l'Organisation mondiale de la santé estime que les données sont manquantes à l'heure actuelle. Vous déclarez « Ces nouveaux vaccins ne sont pas moins efficaces que les précédents, mais on ne peut pas affirmer qu'ils le sont davantage qu'il ne faut donc pas reculer une vaccination ou un rappel au prétexte d'attendre la disponibilité de ces nouvelles versions ». Donc, quel type de vaccin vous recommandez aujourd'hui Et dans le cadre de l'accord mondial de l'OMS sur la prévention, la préparation et la riposte face aux pandémies que vous souhaitez contraignantes, comment allez-vous imposer vos points de vue et pourrait-on avoir ces 14 amendements Je vous remercie. Merci. Docteur Merci. Monsieur le docteur Ryan, vous avez la parole. Et puis, je vois que Madame O'Brien pourra prendre la parole. Euh, docteur Ryan, vous avez la parole. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, in terms of uh, there's, there's just uh, so many questions there. It's very hard to uh, give credible answers to, to all of them in one go. Um, Absolutely. The issue of pandemic preparedness planning is very important, and many, many countries had not updated their, had not updated their pandemic preparedness plans in advance of, of this pandemic. And, you know, we, we're being very clear that preparedness in general around the world was not adequate uh, to deal with the impact of the current pandemic, and we, may, we need to learn that lesson. Uh, that we need to be much better prepared for the next one. And national pandemic preparedness planning, uh, community resilience, collaborative surveillance, community protection, uh, access to countermeasures, uh, safe, scalable clinical care, all of these issues need to be taken into account when we talk about pandemic preparedness planning at national level. At regional and global level, then, we need to be able to support that national planning. And we need to be able to bring the goods, the services, the technologies to support that national planning, uh, mechanisms to, uh, to, to build uh, rapid innovation, rapid scale up of production, fair and equitable distribution of countermeasures to countries, training, uh, and many other things that need to come from a global level to support and supplement what's going on at, on at national level. Without strong national preparedness, there is no global solution. Global health security, regional health security of the European Union is based on a fundamental principle that we need strong national action plans for public health security. And when we can connect strong national systems, we connect them through global data, global services, global collaboration, global innovation, then we have something that looks like global health security. A purely top-down approach to delivering on pandemic preparedness will not work. Pandemics and epidemics begin and end in communities. We need to build community resilience. We need to build community engagement. We need to build frontline primary health care and direct services to people at community level. Uh, we can't do that purely with a global lens. Uh, so I very much agree with, with, with that assessment. With regard to um, YouTube, um, we're not a policeman of YouTube. Our job is not to... Uh, to um, 
uh, say what is on or off on any particular social media or other platform. We engage intensively with social media platforms to ensure that the best uh, information is getting out there. Uh, my view uh, has always been personally that we need to get better at putting strong, positive, scientifically based, evidence based information to ordinary people so they get to make a good, well informed health choice for themselves and for their families. Um, questioning uh, and the ability of ordinary people to question medical interventions is, is an absolute right. Um, hesitancy uh, and, and seeking understanding and explanation for the use of medical products is also. L'interprétation ne passe pas, non pas euh, à cause de la connexion, mais à cause de la qualité du micro, euh, parce que les sons sont décalés. Uh, and actively try to disrupt health responses that are aimed at saving people's lives, and that has happened too often in in this global response. Uh, we don't. Uh, uh, have a formal relationship with the YouTube's or have uh, have specific meetings with with any of those uh, platforms. We do engage with them on improving uh, our messaging, um, and we want to work more closely with platforms to ensure that there is a good discourse, to ensure that there are good debates, and that the right information is out there for people to access. Um, that's a very important uh, concept for us. Um, and uh, the question on vaccines, uh, currently with vaccines and with the emergence of variants and specifically variants in the Omicron space and many sub-variants in that, uh, the WHO TAG-COVAC, the Technical Advisory Group on COVID Vaccination, has um, suggested and, and followed by SAGE have suggested that booster doses of vaccine using Omicron-based uh, boosters uh, is, a, is a useful idea, but that primary vaccination should be with the ancestral strain of vaccine because that gives the best broadest protection across all of the different variants but that booster doses uh, can come uh, from omicron related strains and that's happening more and more with many many companies coming to the market now with uh, booster doses that contain variant strains of, 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 of slight they have slightly different strains but most of them are in the omicron variant uh, uh, site so we continue to recommend primary vaccination, your first uh, two vaccines to come from the ancestral original strain, and then boosters after that, based on a given country circulating strains, may use uh, uh, variant uh, vaccines that, that have slightly different composition based on what the government's judgment in a particular country is for what is their most common circulating strain at any one time. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Monsieur Weimers. Merci et bienvenue, Monsieur Ryan. Je propose qu'on profite de, de l'existence de cette commission pour regarder les origines de, euh, du Covid. Les autorités chinoises refusent de coopérer avec l'OMS et ont fait pression pour que l'on ne dise pas que il est probable que cela ait émergé dans un laboratoire en Chine. Le Parti communiste prétend que ça pourrait avoir commencé en Inde, en Bangladesh, en Norvège, en Russie, en Corée du Sud ou ailleurs. Nous en appelons à une... Deuxième phase d'études de l'OMS reposant sur la science. Et, ce, et pourtant, l'an passé, vous avez dit que l'OMS fonctionne par, euh, en convaincant et n'a pas les moyens de forcer la Chine à coopérer. Docteur, est-ce que la deuxième étape, la deuxième phase, euh, annulera complètement toute la responsabilité de la Chine Comment Avez -vous, comment pouvez-vous accéder aux données brutes euh, des patients en euh, Chine et comment donc euh, complètement euh, faire la lumière et remettre en cause ce que nous dit le Parti communiste chinois Qu'en est-il de, des budgets considérables accordés à l'Institut de virologie de Wuhan, notamment au titre du soi-disant euh, projet d'archives virales euh, européen consacré à la 
je cite, citation, euh, production de virus qui euh, cherche euh, notamment euh, à, aux mesures de sauvegarde sur euh, l'augmentation de la fonction. Merci, monsieur. Madame Donato, vous avez la parole. Merci. Deux questions. D'abord, sur le fonctionnement du règlement euh, sanitaire international et du traité correspondant. Vous avez redit l'importance des parlements dans votre travail. Souhaitez-vous euh, avoir une coopération avec le Parlement européen et notamment avec notre Commission euh, en nous faisant part du projet de traité, ce qui nous permettrait de donner un avis et d'apporter une contribution au titre du Parlement européen à la rédaction de ce traité de la plus haute importance. Deuxième question, l'origine du euh, virus. Je dois dire que je suis extrêmement déçu par le fait que, euh, plus de deux ans et demi après le début de cette histoire, votre institution, votre organisation n'a pas encore réussi à en dire plus sur l'origine du virus. On lit différentes études scientifiques indépendante qui montre que l'origine du virus est euh, synthétique, que le euh, virus du SARS-CoV-2 est euh, euh, synthétique. Et euh, cela peut être démontré sans, non seulement en, en enquêtant dans les laboratoires en Chine, mais rien qu'en regardant la structure du virus. En ce qui concerne le euh, le magazine Bioxrif, par exemple, il y est indiqué les euh, empreintes du virus semblent montrer euh, une origine synthétique du SARS-CoV-2 et ensuite cela euh, reprend toute une liste d'éléments qui expliquent pourquoi l'origine ne peut pas être naturelle. Alors si un certain nombre de chercheurs accrédités remettent cela en cause et ont des raisons de le faire, ben, montrez-le nous. Euh, vous savez bien que euh, la créativité humaine est souvent l'une, euh, ou plus exactement l'avarice, euh, et euh, l'appât du gain est essentiel à la propagation des maladies et c'est sans doute vrai ici euh, aussi et si l'augmentation des fonctionnalités euh, est au cœur de ce virus, eh bien il faudrait interdire la recherche sur ce sujet. Merci. Euh, Madame Lapisa Une question très concrète. Quel est votre avis sur le respect du règlement sanitaire international dans la communication d'alerte, euh, notamment dans le domaine euh, biologique Alors là, je vous cite quelque chose de euh, 2020 et notamment ce qui s'est passé par la suite. Merci. Eh bien, c'est là la question la plus courte que vous nous ayez jamais posée, chers collègues. Docteur Ryan, pour ce dernier cycle de réponses, vous avez la, je vous donne la parole. Um, I'm a little, uh taken aback with some of the assertions being made. Uh, um, we're supposed to be science-based on our observations, yet what I hear here are assessments. You're entitled to your individual assessments, absolutely, as individuals. But uh, you also have to address the evidence in a balanced way. And uh, the paper you refer to is a non-peer-reviewed paper that's just been published as one of thousands of papers that have been published in this in this area uh, in terms of the one you just I believe the one you just referred to. We will wait for that to be peer reviewed. There have been opinions on all sides of this equation in terms of uh, natural origin, engineered origin of this virus, back and forth, back and forth. And there is no consensus, absolutely. WHO has been very, very clear to say that all hypotheses remain on the table because there isn't absolute convincing evidence in either direction. Uh, we keep that and we, we, we keep that position open as further evidence to develops. And we'll read these new papers with great interest and add them to the scientific advisory group on origins, which is a group of uh, experts from all over the world who meet now on a constant basis to consider all of this new evidence 
Uh, in terms of, I, I can't speak to the issue of the EU support to gate of function studies or support to labs in Wuhan. That's for the European Union and its member states to sort out. I'm not there to, to provide you with information as to what your own member states are doing or not doing. Um, the, uh, the issue of uh, lack of power, WHO as a UN organization, as a member state organization, has no legal power to enter a country. In the same way that you there in the European Parliament or the European Union has no legal power to enter a European country. You're a federation of states that have come together for economic integration, social integration, justice integration and, and other things. But there are rights retained by your individual member states. And those rights are sovereign and those rights are protected. And in this context, the rights of our member states are protected. You may not like that. You may not find that acceptable, but that is the reality, and that is the reality of your own organization as you sit there. So please, don't come to me telling me about our lack of power. I understand the limitations of the powers that we have. We push to use the powers that we do have to the maximum, and we accept those limitations, and we accept the subsidiarity of member states and their sovereign right to make their own decisions. If member states then wish to argue with each other whether one member state is doing wrong and one member state is doing right, please do. Come to the World Health Assembly and debate it. Come to the Executive Board and debate it. Debate it between your parliament and the other parliaments that you feel are not representing uh, proper practice. But uh, it's, it's, it's not in the power of WHO to enter a country illegally and carry out what would be, under any national law, illegal activity without an invitation to do so. Um, with regard to uh, the, uh, the different phases of the investigation, we have had teams on the ground. We've had more teams on the ground than any of the European Union teams on the ground or any teams from any of your individual member states. In fact, we've been on the ground a number of times in, in, in China. And it is difficult and it is challenging to be able to get the information that we need to get. But at least we're trying. At least we're there. At least we're trying to get access to the scientific information. We're not just standing on soapboxes and pedestals and telling others what they should be doing. And we will continue to try to get to the bottom of this. We will continue to try and find the source of this virus because it's a very important task if we're going to avoid future pandemics. Uh, with regard to the last question, which was short, in terms of the IHR and compliance with biologic alerts, we've seen a huge increase in compliance with reporting to WHO over the last 20 years in relation to the IHR 2005. In fact, uh, I've been around in, in and out of WHO since 1995. I, I, I notice a huge improvement in compliance, but that doesn't mean that compliance is universal. Some of the countries in your own union are not so transparent in how they engage with WHO in reporting disease. Uh, many countries around the world have real difficulties in being able to report disease, either because they don't have the surveillance systems or because they fear the economic consequences um, as in the consequences to the likes of South Africa, when they openly and transparently reported their variant, uh, the European Union and members of the European Union were very quick to shut down their air traffic and exclude their citizens. So there are real economic and political consequences of transparency. And countries are punished for transparency and continually and repeatedly punished by parliaments, punished by politicians for being transparent. So we need a new deal. We need a new openness. We need to not to have sanctions for reporting. We need to have incentives to report. And we need to put in place checks and balances and supports to countries whose economies will inevitably be disrupted by transparency and by transparently reporting disease. So I think you and, and us at WHO, we have a job to do in your parliaments uh, and in WHO as a member state organization in trying to find better ways to create positive incentives to transparency, positive intensives, incentives to engagement, and getting rid of the negative incentives which many member states uh, have, have put in place uh, and continue to, to pursue, which is, creates a very difficult landscape for us to operate in. Um, the many, many countries around the world engage in lab-based research. Uh, gain of function is just one particular methodology. Biosafety and biosecurity are increasingly common. The availability of bio manipulation techniques and technologies for same are increasing. The opportunity for the misuse of viruses is increasing. The question is, are the motivations for misuse increasing? The motivations to misuse viruses or bacteria is a political process. It's a process around 
whether people wish to do that and whether they, they want to cause harm or create difficulty, the opportunity certainly increases because the technologies are, 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 are increasing. But I would ask you to look at countries in the European Union, countries in North America, countries all around the world who are engaged in a vast array of uh, biologic research uh, for the development of pharmaceuticals, for finding better ways to treat disease. It's happening all over the world. And having a stronger biosafety and biosecurity framework in place would benefit everybody. This is just not in one part of the world. And many countries, particularly countries in the north, are investing in, in studies and investing in uh, uh, work in the south. Uh, it's not just uh, one country or two countries. So we do need to have better oversight and better regulation of how biotechnology has been used. We need much more responsible use of life sciences uh, around the world. And we need to be able to understand that we have responsibilities to ensure that all of our life science research, all of our research in the biologic space needs to be done with high levels of safety and high levels of responsibility. And we look forward to working with the Parliament, we look forward to working with the European Union on trying to strengthen both the, the frameworks for biosafety and biosecurity uh, and also strengthen cooperation and transparency. Uh, it's in our mutual interest to ensure that these things happen. Um, and I look forward to continuing to work with you, the WHO, looks forward to continuing to work with you and we very much thank it has been really the European Parliament and through Charles Michel and others that we saw the initiation of the first idea to create a treaty and in terms of making sure that uh, European Union countries and the Parliament there have access to uh, I believe there will be a draft zero being presented around the treaty in December the European Union is heavily engaged and involved. Many European countries are represented on the international negotiating body. Uh, and I would assume through their good offices that you will see and have an opportunity to contribute to the development of the accord or, or framework convention or treaty uh, in, the, in due course. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. And Merci beaucoup, Dr. Ryan. Ça, c'est certain. Nous avons certainement rebondir sur la question au sein de cette commission en Covid, pas seulement euh, sur les leçons engrangées, mais justement en retirer des leçons, avoir euh, des informations sur les traités Covid, mais aussi changer la réglementation internationale sanitaire, parce qu'il y a deux facettes de la même médaille qui sont toutes aussi importantes pour nous. Il est certain que nous nous posons des questions sur le rôle de la Chine, parce que nous avions l'Afrique du Sud plus tôt dans cette réunion. L'Afrique du Sud a fait ce qu'elle avait à faire lorsqu'elle avait découvert le virus Omicron. Elle a fait rapport immédiatement sur la question. Et au lieu d'en être récompensé, le monde a puni l'Afrique du Sud. Donc, il y a vraiment quelque chose qui est mal embouché ici. Ce n'est pas vraiment à l'OMS d'assumer les responsabilités. Il ne faut pas le pointer du doigt, mais il faut quand même régler ces questions et renforcer ces traités internationaux, cette réglementation internationale pour être certain que nous sommes bien plus résilients au niveau mondial, que nous pourrons bien mieux coopérer également. Merci en tout cas de votre présence, merci de votre franchise, j'apprécie. Il est important que chacun puisse poser ses questions et que l'on puisse aussi avoir des réponses de manière franche. Et c'est une bonne chose selon moi. C'est utile en tout cas. Ceci permet d'améliorer nos connaissances que nous pourrons injecter dans le rapport que nous allons rédiger l'année prochaine. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Ayn. Merci également à tous les collègues qui sont restés jusqu'au bout. De nouveau, c'était une matinée fort intensive. On était là depuis 9h, 9h30 en l'occurrence. Je vous souhaite une très bonne pause déjeuner. On se revoit la prochaine fois. Prochaine fois qui est quand Le 14 novembre.